So welcome Paris, Dorset and Texas again. I'm just waiting for yeah, what's happening here. I still don't have your... Um, Sorry. Oh, it's coming. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here we yeah. are. It's a, it's a, <clears throat> a non-technical error. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it is. Okay, everybody, welcome so much. And uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, so fantastic to see that we are gathered from pretty much all over the world. New Zealand, that is basically if you dig a hole uh, in from Denmark, where I am, and go to the other side of the earth, that is pretty close to New Zealand, actually. So it is almost uh, as much on the other side as, uh, of the globe as you can come. My name is Pierre Haugo. Um, I work in the Lego Foundation um, as a facilitation manager. And we're going to be together for this uh, one hour where we're going to dig into uh, how to facilitate learning through play. Um, and let's look at the agenda. So welcome, that's pretty much what I've done now. Um, how will we do this? Who am I? Let's play Faci facilitation. Uh, on learning through play and let's play you will be some you, you will be active for once in a while in this um and uh, yeah let's get to that we would like you to uh, mainly stay muted uh in this session but use the chat a lot there'll be different prompts from different times where we would love you to uh, to chip in with uh, with different stuff and then occasionally then marie will if you have um questions that we would like you to to say and then marie will unmute you and ask me so she's like the the chair of the thing. Um, oh, I'm the assistant. I'm just right here, waiting for questions. <sighs> you are my eyes and ears because I can't see the chat when I'm sharing. So that's. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so next next agenda item is who am I and who are the Lego Foundation? So so going towards this in a in a rather classical fashion, I would imagine that the next slide. Oh, Marie. I cannot see your screen. You cannot see my screen. No. I am screen sharing, it says. And okay. Can everyone else see my screen? Okay. Thank People you. are nodding? No, that's okay. You got it, Marie? Yeah. Great. <laughs> um, but, okay, so who am I? Next topic, which is like, if I was going about this in a classical fashion, the next slide you would see could potentially be like a list of, uh, of, of uh, my CV-ish thing. Who am I? Who am I doing like that? But that is something I find awfully boring. Uh, and, and usually something where I would be telling you my preferred story. Uh, so we're going to go about this in a little bit of a different way. We're going to ask you, so what would you need to know about me or like to know about me if you were able to listen to me for the next 45 minutes? So any question goes, basically. What would you find interesting to know about your facilitator or your teacher for, uh, for you to be able to listen well? Shoot. Have you ever taught in a school? Yes, 10 years middle school. Do you love Lego? Uh, very, very much, definitely. More questions? Mm -hmm. No? Do you design games? No, no, I don't. No, no I'm. Um, um, I say what I design is is teaching. Uh, so, so it is pedagogy that is. But games, the gamification or games like that. No. Another question. One is very funny. Are you happy today? <laughs> <laughs> ah, I'm in Denmark. It's November. It's dark. Um, I am happy because I'm here with you. I say that's that's lightening up my day. Besides that, everything else is quite grey and wet here. <laughs> We have a lot of questions about your background with visual impairment and blind children. That's a good question because that is extremely limited. I, I, I have no practical experience myself. I'm, I'm totally I played the blind student with you once. Yes, you did. That, that's, I'll say, and I also visited uh, Worcester, uh, the School of the Blind, uh, and, and during this, that we were doing all of this, but all of my practical experience comes from, from children with, with normal uh, vision. So um, there's stuff that I'm potentially going to say where you'll be shaking your head and say, yeah, he don't know what he's talking about, what I'm dealing with every day. And that's okay. That's a, that's a transition that I trust that you are able to make. What's your favorite game? My 
favorite game. Wow, uh, it's a sport uh, for me. So I play golf. Um, used to play football, but I'm gotten a little bit too old. So now I'm a golfer. Have you ever been in Mexico? No, never. Oh. And that's embarrassing because we have a huge program in Mexico uh, and have had that for years. Um, Colombia, yes. San Antonio, yes. Uh, but no, never Mexico. What's your background? I was uh, originally trained a uh, teacher. So I have uh, with, um, with major, major subjects in uh, physical education and music. Uh, but I taught everything in middle school. That's how we are trained in Denmark. We don't have like, we can teach everything up to seventh grade. If you want to teach more than seventh grade, you need to have a specialized in what you're teaching. But besides that, it is big emphasis on pedagogy and psychology, child psychology in, the, in our four year teacher education. So basically you can teach everything. It's not that it's tough, I would say math second grade, if you know your pedagogy. It's really, <laughs> uh, so that's, and then later on, I took a master's degree in uh, learning processes, uh, took two years out uh, when I was in my 30s and went back to university and, and uh, did my, um, on that. Did you play with Lego as a child? I did, I did. This is Denmark. I grew up like uh, 40 kilometers from Billund uh, and, and yeah, that's a, that's a. And what surprises you the most as children? With children. As a child, I think. I'm, I'm not sure I got the question, Marie. One more time. It's, it's written, what surprises you the most as children? I would like to ask you what was the biggest surprise you had as a child or, or what was I, surprising I would you? It the other way around, what, what, what surprises me in children. Mm, yeah. I, I would say that, that they they keep astonishing me with the with the spirit that they usually have they are always like let's try again i'm failing it's just such a big part of them of of how they go about life is trying and iterating and 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 yeah and and i think we forget about something about that as we grow old one last question what is your favorite type of game of lego play spectrum free play guided play etc someone did their homework uh, yeah. <laughs> <about> that. <laughs> i am probably a bit more into uh, guided play structured play since i come from sports and then physical education and i really really enjoy games where we have decided on the rules first and that we play to some rules sometimes we even need to put in a referee because we we challenge the rules but i i enjoy those uh, the whole free play kind of do whatever we want dance around and do like uh, that that sometimes confuses me a little bit i think that says something about my type profile but that's just, just the last one yes. what would you like us to take home today i want you to become inspired i want you to become inspired and curious about your own uh, your own practice so if anything from here is making you wonder hmm could i have done that slightly different uh, and go home and try just a little bit a tweak then i'm more than happy it's uh, that's uh, Thank you. That's all the questions you got. And the funny thing I would say that this time there actually were people who, who asked about my formal education and many, many times. There are no one who are curious about that at all. It can be really funny things like, do you have a dog or do you like uh, other things that comes to mind? And it is a little bit, I would say, also doing this activity of trying to reverse the need in the relationship between the student, student and the teacher. And I know that you guys who work in the special needs sector, you are amazing at doing that on a daily basis. But when we come to, um, we want to inspire people to have a learning through play mindset as facilitators. It is very much to take that view of what could be helpful to, to my student in this situation where we are doing this thing together. And, and, and it is complicated to do at all times. And the more children we have, it is even more complicated. Uh, but still, it is such a, a, a mindset shift that is quite, uh, quite important. So I work in the Lego Foundation. Uh, the Lego Foundation is a D Danish foundation that is uh, owned by the Lego uh, family. Uh, to those of you who do not know, the, know it, Lego is, uh, is a third, third and soon fourth generation 
uh, own family uh, 80 somewhat years um, since they were invented and they uh, they have i would say a foundation like many other uh, good and, and strong companies have um, the lego foundation owns 25 percent of the lego group meaning that that 25% of the profit that is made out of selling Lego bricks in the world goes back into the Lego foundation. So not many people knows that. And if you look at like Facebook, Google, so these guys, they usually have a CSR foundation or, or something like that with where they enter like one or 2% of, of, of their earnings. But here uh, it is 25%, which is a, a huge contribution. The Lego foundation aims to push the understanding of play to push and change the perception of, of play, what it can do and why we should be doing it. Because play is still perceived as something childish, something we should stop doing and start working. Uh, we could almost hear it in our own rhetoric from time to time, kind of, it's like, oh, stop playing and start working now, come on. Uh, and, and there is something there in that narrative that we really want to push and, and and we can do that, I would say, especially by providing, of course, a lot of evidence. So we support a lot of research in this field, but of course, also to share a lot of practice examples and good ways where we could leverage, um, leverage what happens to all of us when we are allowed to be playful, when we are engaging in whatever we're doing. Because this is not actually only for children, this is actually also for us. If we are, could become playful doing our job, we would have a, such a big chance of, of uh, doing the job much better, first of all, enjoying it much, much more, and developing some crucial skills that we would need to cope with the rest of the life, uh, the rest of our life uh, down the line. So that is, uh, that is the Lego Foundation aim and, and, and purpose. Um, we see, back to the question around the children, which was actually quite good, we see the children as our role models in many ways so so oftentimes we we really try to reverse and see what would a child naturally do in this situation what would be their natural approach to this situation and and let that guide us because they are we don't need to teach children to learn <laughs> we don't need to teach children to play because there are so many things that sits naturally in us and we have a deep belief in that so there's, there, there exists a deep level of, of humanism, you know, say, in the way that we approach and see children and see humans uh, generally, which is really, really nice. We have projects all over the world now. We have, we have grown rapidly in, uh, in, in what, what a size organization we, we are. When I joined, we were seven, uh, which is close to 10 years ago. And today we are like 115 or something like that. And it's been especially the last three, four years where we have doubled ourselves pretty much every year. And also our activities around the world. The, doing the, the Braille, the Lego Braille is one of them. Uh, and a, a long range of activities that we do in, uh, in, in many, many, many different countries around the world. Um, so that's great. Look up, the, look up, look up our webpage. Uh, if you want to follow Lego Foundation on Twitter and Facebook, uh, if you want to know more about the different programs and initiatives that we, where we try to push this agenda, that play is something that is needed. It is actually a right for children and something that we should try to embed wherever we can. So what is it that we believe in, in the Lego Foundation? So we believe that there is a set of skills that we all need to be able to cope with life. There is a set of, of holistic skills that, that, that children need to practice and develop to become creative and engaged lifelong learners. For them to be able to serve themselves and, and everyone around them, the communities, uh, and be active citizens. Um, those skills are some that we have, <laughs> not something that we have come up with ourselves. We have, of course, dug deep into our, say, classical child development. We work closely, closely with, with, with I almost say hundreds of universities, but in, in this specific project, at least 20 different universities to kind of narrow down which terminology are we using around this? Because what you're going to see on the next slide is that the skills that we, that we work with is definitely someone that most people will be nodding to. It's not something that is whoo, groundbreaking or like that. But, but what we truly do believe is that for you to cope and manage your life in a good and orderly fashion, uh, you need to be balancedly developed within these five skills. And so you need to be cognitively quite well-functioning. You need to be emotionally quite fun well-functioning. 
your physical skills need to be in order your social skills need to be operating and your creative skills need some to be operating as well we could we could if this was i think this was what my colleague Mede was doing a lot uh, just yesterday if any of you were on that call was digging deeper into what is into each of these i have a small fun thing that i usually ask uh, people and 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 i'd like to ask you that too if we now uh, we do a little imaginary game that there is an evil wizard that appears just next to you, poof, and he or she is going to say, bugger, I'm going to take away one of your five skills and you're going to live the rest of your life without that skill. Uh, but you can decide which one you should go without yourself. Which one would you take out and say, hmm, okay, <laughs> I'm... That would have the least effect on me. <laughs> so which Creative. skill? Do... Yes. So someone would, uh, when, when you face a closed door and you do not really know how to open it, you'll just be standing there for the rest of your life because coming up with new ideas would be challenging. <laughs> Physical? Physical, yeah. That's, uh, that, that's something complicated, of course. You have no physical skills, but at least your brain would be working, right? Some, someone wrote known have to run. That's really hard and not something I have ever thought of before. Oh, something new, hey? Can't choose. Same. You should pick one. The wizard is standing there. It's getting impatient. No? Creative, oh. emotional, emotional. Emotional, ooh, then you could become president. No, um, I, <laughs> I would say, sorry, sorry for the poor joke. Someone, um, someone says, makes me think about why if we need them all so much, not all of them have the same importance in school. That's a good, that's a good reflection. That's a really good reflection, right? And, and I would yeah. say that depending on the situation, you'd probably need some of them differently, right? And, and depending on um, what you do, there would be other situations. But of course, it's a silly question. And it's actually silly just to divide them because they are so, they are so highly connected to each other that it, it, it does not make any sense. The you first project we had some years ago, they were, they were actually in, a, in like a circle where they were divided. But we tried to put them together in, in our newest version here in more like a brain to kind of show that they are, of course, interconnected and you cannot divide them like that. But, and I think that's why someone suggests a little bit of each. Exactly, exactly. But that's, and I would imagine that if we were like a, if we were working in HR or something like that, someone could probably come up with a test that would, would give you a score on each of these where you could say that there are places of these where you are stronger than others and there are someone who are stronger in their social skills than maybe in their cognitive skills, right? Or maybe someone is, is whatever um, and we could be thinking. Our whole point is that when we do activities that where we do learning through play, we pretty much automatically are massaging and exercising and developing these and if we go down and do, when we do studies down, I would say, especially in early childhood, there, there is like, a, a, it is extremely important for us to be allowed to learn through play because we need to be flexible and really balancedly develop within these to be able to maneuver whatever life hits us, hits us with, because that's what get, are gonna get us back on our feet or get, gonna get us, that is if we are strong and resilient in these and also I would say infusing our whole learning potential sits within these uh, categories. So this is what we truly believe in the foundation. That's, that's our aim. Our aim is to support children to have a, a good holistic skills development for them to go out and maneuver life and have value to people and societies around themselves. It is a, uh, in many ways, a traditional way of looking at children. It's very Danish in many, many ways, very, very Danish to have that broad view and sense of, uh, of child development as this. We are highly influenced by, by a German philosophy tradition uh, in general in the way that our school system and things are. Okay, never mind. How, um, but how do we get these? So that's, uh, and as I always said, learning through play. But what is learning through play? And we dug into this question about five or six years ago uh, to try to actually say, um, we must come up with some kind of description towards what characterizes a learning through play a, a, a 
situation for you. Um, and we again we engage with the academic community and and a lot of researchers and a lot of practice, and and narrowed it down to five characteristics that describes the quality of a child's experience um, in and situation. Because to be honest, we can have a lot of activities that look like play, but are super boring. That is really really like oh my god, this is boring. But it, it, it was supposed to be a fun game, but it's not because it's missing something. And I'm really bored and I'm stopping this because I don't want to be here. Sometimes there's a lot of, I see a lot in, in, the, in the school world that is what I call chocolate covered broccoli. It is broccoli. And then we put a little bit of chocolate on it, but it's still, it's still broccoli. <laughs> Just put some chocolate on it. And, and so there's a lot of rote learning that is happening, like especially when that whole e-learning kind of thing. Someone asked me about if I build game, if you look back in the old gamification days, which, which is a few, it's almost like a decades back when that was like really the big thing when everyone should be gamification. But there was a lot of that that was like disguised rote learning and did not have these characteristics of what a good quality learning through play experience has. And these are, these are the ones. This is what you should experience in an activity for you to enter a playful state of mind. So it's extremely subjective and it could be different from person to person. The same activity could trigger a playful state of mind in Joanna, but not in George. And wow, just to put even more toll on us facilitators. Oh, that, is, that is always so uh, tremendously complicated. So what we know is that if you feel an activity, that you feel that you are actively engaged in an activity, um, actively engaged means uh, that you have agency, that you are the player, that you are calling some shots, you are making decisions, you are actively engaging in what's happening. You are not just following instructions. You are not just copying. You are not just getting it right or look because that's just someone else has made it and I'm doing the same calculation or the same model and see I'm holding it up, I have the correct one. That, is, could be, that could be a good learning approach to some things, but it's not necessarily actively engaging, which is if that's out, I would say that's one of the big ones in terms of uh, and you entering a playful. You need to feel that you're part of, of you doing something in this. We see that usually if, if a situation is made so it's iterative, that you are, it's not like a one-off, you're doing it, you're redoing it, we're trying, we're testing, we're figuring out, we're learning more. That is allowing you to enter a playful state of mind. So meaningfulness slash sense, uh, it makes sense to you. You know why you're learning it, you know why you, you, what you, why you need it for. How is this building upon something I know already? Do I need this piece of learning? Or is it just something my teacher says, yeah, you need this for exam. It's kind of, okay, that's really like the lowest point of, 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 uh, of why you need something. Um, you need to learn something. Socially interactive, which happens in many different ways. Uh, it can be like, really near, fast. It could be on a distance. It can be, and joyful. Joyful, which has like, a, it's, a dual, it's a dual sort because joyfulness is actually also sometimes struggle, <laughs> that it can be a really hard task, but because of some of all the other factors and you're actually enjoying it, you keep on task. So you see your attention span is, 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 is improving. And then when you succeed with a difficult task, then yeah, you get the joy and the smile but it's not that you are smiling at all times in, in a learning through play experience you can actually also be really really uh, it's tough uh, from time to time so those are the characteristics of the of the of the learning through play experience and again my, my colleague Mette and James just had a session on that it's going to be out there if you want to dig deeper into these but these would be tick points these would be things that we would be looking for uh, and also in student behavior, we have like a matrix where we have like the different student behaviors that is the kind of showing uh, how can I see if my students are doing this? How can I, how can I uh, in, in dialogues with them, get an idea of if, if they feel this or do not feel this? Um, so yeah, <gasps> Whew, that was already all, over 15 minutes of talk from my side. Sorry, guys, I'm not, uh, I'm not always taking my own medicine here and at least not in this speed version. Now we need to have you guys uh, engaged and you need to be hands-on. We're going to do a few, uh, a few hands-on tasks now and they have, a, they have a certain purpose to them, which I'll explain afterwards. So I need you to, to find uh, three Lego bricks if you have if you have duplo bricks like i have it can be it can be good but it could also be lego system bricks if you had red blue and and 
and yellow. It's super cool. If you don't have, then it's it's also cool. So can you hold up your Lego bricks in front of the camera? Then we can. Uh... Good. So what's going to happen is we're going to do two different activities that are demonstrating a little bit around uh, around facilitation. One of one of our one of our big points. So first, are you ready? Yeah, I guess you are. You can't talk. So, so that's, that's how it is. Uh, I'm going to take something away. Now I'm, I am actually building a model here under my table. And I am going to hold that up in front of the camera for just a few seconds. And it is then for you to build exactly the same model. I will not ask if you're ready because you have to be. And I'm taking it away. That was easy, wasn't it? Could you show? I can actually only see two participants. That's a little bit unfair uh, on this. Sorry, uh, I, no, I, can I can see a lot. I can scroll here. Hey, I can see a lot of people. Hola, Mexico. <laughs> Sorry, I was just scrolling through you guys. I see, I see some familiar faces. That's uh, nice. So, did you get it right? Should I hold it up again? So, we have one that is like uh, it is horizontal, and then we have the red one that is uh, it's pointing out from the side of that one, and then the top one, the third layer, is going out sideways. I see a lot of people getting it right. Woo! Yeah. Good job, guys. Good job. So that was one type of activity. We could we could do it again. We should maybe do it again, but we won't do it again. Sorry. But that was like one type of activity of us doing it. It's fun. It's kind of fun. Kids usually usually enjoy these games, and it it is nothing nothing bad in that. Nothing wrong in that. Next activity, I am going to ask you to take uh, six Lego bricks. Color is not important, but six six Lego bricks. If you have duple bricks, you can use those. System bricks, you can use those. Marie, are you are you drawing on my slides? No. No, no. I'm not. I just got a, a an arrow suddenly. No, never mind. <laughs> okay, now I want you to think back. Um, I want you to build with these six bricks an animal that you would have loved to have when you were a child. So if you would have loved, I won't say anything because then I'll be biased on you. You know that's the word. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, Pia. I think you're muted. Okay. Good. Sorry, Marie. <laughs> no, no, I, it's my fault because there was a lot of noise, so I've mute everyone. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Whoa! Again. <laughs> yeah, please check you are muted like that. We won't have the noise. So, 30 seconds to build the animal you would have loved to have when you were a child. With only six bricks. So, time's up. Could you please show your bricks to the camera? And Marie is going to touch upon just a few of you to ask what you built. Can you show your creations to the camera? I see a few that yeah. are still building. The test is over. Put down your pen. I can see a snake. Marie why, Marie, why don't you ask people to tell what they did? Yeah. What did you do? You can un unmute yourself and just talk to us. Marie, I think you should ask someone. Yeah. A rabbit. A sheep. A bird. Max. Well, yeah, do you want to share with us? A bird. A bird. Okay, great. You can see a puppy, a dinosaur. Tracy, do you want? It's a puppy. 
<laughs> Sapi, great. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, guys. Dragon, you guys. dog, bunny, dog, cat. Thank you so much. I'm going to stop you right here. Um, I tried to build a dog, but that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like my horse. That's your horse, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for playing along. And I would say I would urge you to keep uh, keep playing with the Lego bricks because it says on the slide, no idle hands. It's, uh, but most, most people know that and do that already, right? So, but, okay, we did these two activities. And we, we did them in many ways to, to try to make two different points on this continuum that we're seeing on the slides right now. So, so we, we would say that when we facilitate learning through play, sometimes we are in the free play area, which you could say that the last activity that we did, there was a lot level of agency, but there were still some frames. It was totally free. You were only allowed to use six bricks. There were another frame of time. There were some constraints. I had decided it was an animal that you should be thinking of. I had decided a few things. And then in there, there were some freedoms. So we could just maybe say that that was actually not really free play peer. That was a little bit further to the right on this continuum. Uh, and I would, I, would, <laughs> I would accept that. But then you could say that the other one that we were doing, where I actually had made a model that you should be copying, that would probably sit quite further to the right in some ways, right? It was a bit more me instructing and you getting to a certain point following me and following what I had done. I could easily, with a few tweaks, have moved that activities if I had just say, paired you up and said, okay, now you're going to come up with, with activities for each other. And suddenly, at least the one who were creating would be on the other end of that continuum and there would be some kind of ping pong going on. And, and what I would have loved about that tweak was that I would not be in the center of attention. So, so, so in learning through play facilitation, it is very, very much about we, how we position ourselves as facilitators. And, and again, I'm going to come back to that, how we re regard ourselves. Do I regard myself as the guy who is holding all the knowledge and I will pour my knowledge into your poor heads, which I'm doing right now, I'm so sorry. Um, or, um, or do I regard, I would say myself as a co-learner, as a, someone who's facilitating other people's learning, but they need to be active in that equation. So I need to engage them so that they can be actively engaging. There is none of this, of that continuum that we would say is right or wrong. There's none of this that is right or wrong because all of this is needed. Facilitation is like playing a card of poker, I would say. So you need to be able to play different cards at different times. And that goes for, that goes for learning through play facilitation as well. Sometimes it is good for us to say, guys, stop, please, could you all, can I have your attention? I have a message for all of you right now and we're gonna take that collectively and I'm going to let you know something because you're gonna spend forever to figure it out and we're not gonna go down that line. So going to the instruction side of things and at other times it would make more sense to let them figure it out all by themselves. We believe that there is a bit of a sweet spot in the middle section of this where we, if we get it right, we are able to cater for, for both positions uh, we like things like project-based learning, for instance, uh, or and and all branches and 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 like there is a lot of lot of words that sits within that uh, design thinking, blah blah blah. Kind of, we we could come up with a whole booklet of of things that is basically is the same but with with other wordings, and and we kind of like those because they engage the subject, they engage the learner. Uh, at really, really, and the learner has some kind of definition of what they would like to learn within some certain frames. And that is immediately hitting a lot of the, ticking a lot of the boxes of the things that we're looking for. Uh, and it is putting the teacher in a certain position. So, uh, so we really, really like that. So this leads us towards our, the Lego Foundation's third framework, which is what do we need to do to have students feel five play characteristics so that they can develop the five holistic skills. So there is like a, there is like a chain towards this. And our framework is very, very simple. It is almost like a Vygotsky-ish triangle, a pedagogical triangle, uh, because of how 
to go about designing an activity where children should feel the five player characteristic. But of course, there is something that is a little bit special to it. So we spent, we spent some years actually, and, and quite a lot of research, quite a lot of desk research, uh, looking into literature, figuring out what are the pedagogies that, are, that we would define to be learning through play pedagogies already because it's out there. If we look at progressive pedagogies in general, there are, I would say, they have been doing loads of this since the 50s and the 60s of the things that we would say, wow, that's actually what we're talking about. They just call it something else. So, so, so we have, if you look into the Lego Foundation white papers and we have two on facilitation, there is like a list of pedagogies that we kind of say, okay, when, they, when the Montessori's talk about that, that's actually the same thing we are talking about. We just phrase it differently. Uh, when Reggio Emilia is doing those things, that is what they, when High Tech High are doing uh, project-based learning like that, that is actually the same things. So, so those guys, we have, of course, uh, not saying that we have been like reinventing the wheel, but looking into a lot of those pedagogies that, that are doing things in, in the ways that we believe in. But, that, but then still we needed to be able to talk about this with professionals and, and also in a way that professionals are able to relate to, which led us towards this uh, pedagogical framework. That, that contains of these four different, um, four different elements, the mindset, the design, the practice, and the reflection. And as you see, the design, practice, and reflection, which on the Vygotsky model is, sits within that triangle and triangulation, but it is being tumbled around by someone who has a certain mindset. And that's like, so the mindset is almost like the overarching thing in this because it is defining how the three others are, come, are being played out. So, and I'm going, I'm going to explain all four of them, but, but, but generally you could say that if I had the mindset of my students being someone who should learn from my deep well of knowledge, and I have 40 weeks for me to, to send all that knowledge into their heads, uh, then I would probably, when I was preparing, I would probably read up on all the thick books so that I could make sure that I could convey all this good knowledge that I have. I would potentially design most of my classes and in a, in a certain way, which would lead to a practice where I would spend as much time I could making sure that I am conveying what, that, what they should learn from me potentially at the blackboard that would be when i went to school now it could maybe be at some other mediums but still in its same way where i would give them new knowledge from me to you uh, like that and i would imagine that my my mindset would make that my reflection or my evaluation would be very much to be checking whether whether or not that transformation has happened if they were clever enough to take all my deep knowledge and i would tick some boxes and i would let them know if they succeeded or not because Generally, I would potentially know that I succeeded because that's how you transfer knowledge, right? That was how I learned it. And that was how they potentially should be learning it. So I know I'm stereotypingly wildly here, but I'm, I'm, I'm quite sure that many of you have, have experienced teachers where you would have a, a suspicion that that was the mindset that they had. Uh, and potentially some of you have colleagues <laughs> still where you would be suspicious if that's how they see themselves. And that's how they see their students. And that's very much what said category is about. And that's how it's informing our prep, our practice, and our reflection slash evaluation of our lessons. Okay, digging deeper into Marie, you let me know if there are any burning questions or things that are, that are coming on the chat, right? Um, Not so far. I'll just uh, carry on. We actually have a, we actually have another hands-on activity that we should have get you guys going with, but uh, I'm running a little bit late on time. But that's uh, I think we're going to do it because I think the idle hand things is not a bad thing. So that's going to be a little so, bit of a, an active break before we dig into these four categories. Yeah, uh, and don't worry. At the beginning, I said it's a forty-five minute session, but I know we've booked a two-hour session, so. Ah, you can stay and talk. Might be some people who would get late for dinner or something like that. Yeah. I will not do that to you. So guys, we ask you to bring some cardboard and some a pair of scissors. And that was actually because one thing that the Lego Foundation is really big on right now is on how can we do 
all these cool things we want to we can do with the lego bricks that is awesome because we can take them apart we can put them together we, we can iterate so fast and so easy and it is no there's no fear of failure because we can just redo it is amazing medium for that could we do that without the lego brick could we transform that system lego system thinking into something else so right now we are working very much with recycled materials like cardboard plastics and things like that and we have come up with uh, a system in play where we can actually punch holes uh, in, in uh, recycled cardboard and connect them and take them apart and reconnect them if we want to again. So, so the whole magic trick to this are something that we call uh, connectors, which is basically a piece of cardboard, which it is two centimeters times one centimeter. And we have then caught it cut like small slits from both sides into it. We have then rolled it together as a tube. And when it is a tube like this, now it has been used once, so it's a little bit tricky. And I have like two holes on two pieces of cardboard. I can put it together through both holes. Ah, this one got, it, got bad. So I have the other one. I can put it together from both sides. And then I unfold the slits and I give them a little push. And now suddenly, these two sticks and if i want to i can take this apart and i can reconnect it and reuse it again if my connectors break which mine just did i can just make new ones i can because it costs nothing it is just uh, this is actually from my tea package i think this morning that i made this uh, it's something that we all have cereal box cardboard is the easiest to work with for children from i'll say from three to six when they go above six they can start getting into what you could call brown cardboard and do things in 3D and build structures and houses and things like that. And we are actually, sorry, it's a piece of commercial, a commercial break. Um, we are actually uh, launching a whole web page with ideas and activities on how to leverage local materials. So for the next 20 minutes, I am going to call that there are, you know, there are no idle hands allowed. I would love to see you cut out something that you are connecting to something. So if you want to make, I, this could be almost be like a snowman, right? Do you want to build a snowman? No. Um, or I could have made it into a car <laughs> or I could, and then I could have made like a, like a square thing that I had attached to it here and brrr, I had done that or I could make a pair of glasses or it could become anything. With a lot of children, we work with basic shapes because it is really, really good for many, many other things. Um, so, what could you do in the next 20 minutes where you are creating something out of basic shapes and are reconnecting them using these small cardboard connectors made out of this? And we're going to see them and show them in the end. Then I'm going to fill out oh, with me talking while you are working. Okay, no idle hands. The good thing about this, there's, there's no need to be afraid of failing because if it messes up, it don't cost anything and you can just try again. Uh, which is a really nice approach. So, okay, back from, uh, back from the uh, no idle hands and a little bit of a commercial break. Now uh, I'm going to talk you through the four categories of facilitating with the learning through play and what it is that we see the world's best learning through play facilitators usually do. What are the ones that we want to learn from? What are they doing and how are they doing things? So the mind for, mindset informs your design, your practice and reflection, as I just said. We truly do believe that children are born to learn from birth. We truly do believe that they are capable, they are curious, and they are able to make decisions. And together with them, we can learn and we can explore and we can reimagine the current patterns that they have inside them, the current patterns we have inside us as teachers. So we really want to, I would say, with that mindset to approach uh, that almost social contract it is when you and someone is engaging in having them learn something. And I know, I know, we know that in many contexts, this is potentially a little bit challenging because the teacher is expected to be an authority. The teacher is expected to be someone who is standing up there and is almost preaching out with knowledge and it is expected of you to take that position. And of course, we are challenging all these systems, all that we can. We are pushing on all 
ministries of education and all systems that we can that this is an approach that is viable if we want to build these skills that allows us to establish 21st century skills in the world and if we want to build stronger democracies if we want to build all of those things we will get nowhere if we don't change that mindset of how we engage with our children that was a big one. Sorry, I got, I got a little bit carried away there. But that, it is, that is actually how deep we believe in this. And when we see ourselves as someone who are trying to make the world a better place by equipping children, um, all children, uh, with the tools for them to go out and make a difference. So as a facilitator, you engage children in playful experiences that deepens their understanding and enables them to practice and grow that breadth of skill. You spark curiosity. I think that's a really, really key thing. There's no, uh, no bigger driver to learning than curiosity. We all know it. If you are curious about something, you could chase down the internet for hours. You could, look at in, you could look at YouTube videos or you could go to the library and search for books for a piece of thing that you, I don't get this, I really want to know this. If you've gotten to that point that you want to know something, there's almost no stopping you for getting to that point. And if we in any way can help our children get to that, we have just won such a long, uh, so we just yeah, come such a long way. It is important that you create the space and time for many kinds of playful activities where children make meaningful choices to pursue their questions and interests. You spot opportunities to integrate learning goals in ways that inspire children's engaged and playful endeavors rather than disrupting and directing them. There's a big paradox here of when do we step in as teachers? That's, and the one, <laughs> there's no right answer to this one. But still, if you are in doubt, stay away, I would say. If they are engaged, if they are going with the activity, don't disturb them. Hold back. You are the one that are flexible in the role. You, you in, the, in the room, you adapt your role to match where the children are as they take on new challenges, meaning that you need to be that octopusy. And I know speaking with children who, uh, teachers who work with uh, children with special needs, I am preaching to the choir here. I am teaching to the ones who are doing this the most. <laughs> I am speaking to the ones who are, that's your everyday thing. Uh, and uh, yeah, I admire you for that. I would say there are so many teachers who are not working with children with special needs that could learn so much from you on especially this point. Um, yeah, this playful approach builds on how we naturally learn. And in, in learning through play, everyone is a learner, children and adults alike. So this is, this is the starting point and the end point of this model, of course, that depending on where we are in our beliefs and how we see things and also what system we sit in, what are our options for change? Because sometimes someone sit in a very rigid school system with a very fixed curriculum where they're not allowed to change a lot and it can be complicated and it can only be minor tweaks that they are able to put in. But still, that is, I will say, that is a good starting point. Good. Let's move on towards the... Um, the design. So what is it that we see that the good and best learning through play facilitators do in terms of preparation? And back to the question that I got, if I was a game designer or not, I would say we all are in some ways. We are at least designers to the point that we design learning experiences. We design uh, moments where someone are able to learn new stuff. We are designing experiences for someone to grow, opportunities for someone. And for me, that is almost as beautiful as being a Michelin chef. That is almost as beautiful as someone composing a new opera or someone composing something because you are trying to think carefully through how would this activity be able to allow these five play characteristics come to life in the children that I'm looking at. And it, they are a good design marker in many ways. They are, so, so how would my students actually be enjoying this? Would they find this funny? How are my students actually, would this be meaningful to them? How would this make sense to them? Do they need this piece of knowledge for anything? How would they be actually engaged in this? What kind of choices are they actually making in this? Are they the player in this? Or are they actually just following some kind of, are they, and just questions like those are extremely good for us when we 
think about engaging into tomorrow's lesson. And that's what we definitely see. We know that learning through play is carefully planned. And, and sometimes when we step into rooms with some of the people that we admire, it could to some eyes look chaotic. <laughs> it looks messy. Learning through play is sometimes loud. Uh, <laughs> and to someone who steps into that space, if the principal walks by on the hallway and, and enters the door, they could say, oh my goodness, he or she, depending on who's the teacher, are not in control of these children. They do not know what they are all doing. And I would tell them, that's totally correct. Yes, they are not. And they are not supposed to. But please ask the children what they are doing because they should know and they should know why they're doing it and what they're trying to learn. Again, that's a huge mindset shift, but it is still, it's a, it's a control loss where we should actually have some courage in our design to say, I will not be able to follow all children at all times because some is actually out doing something or some is doing something on their own and it is cool. There are a range of different pedagogical models you can use for, uh, I would say, for doing your preparation. I just mentioned the five play characteristics. You can look into any pedagogical uh, literature and find uh, many, many different types. We have one here, which we call connect, explore, transform, which could offer some kind of progression into a lesson where you could, where there are a subset of questions which you could ask yourself. But uh, I would say there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing new to these in many ways, I would say. They are built with that kind of certain flow to it. If any one of you have been into like design thinking or has been into other of maker spaces or many of these different pedagogical trends, I would call them, that has been passing over the last decade almost, there is there are many of these words that are the same and back to i would say to the first sentence learning through play is first of mostly carefully planned we planned it we thought about it we went in we tried and we i'm gonna get to the, that that's the next part of this that is what learning through play facilitation is all about more than that there is a magical recipe of this is how you do learning through play facilitation uh, it is actually you going about it like this. So um, the next part of our triangle is of course doing it, the practice. So what do we see in this practice? And, and here I could refer back to the continuum that we had before, because you need to be an octopusy. You need to be an jazz musician <laughs> that are improvising. You need to be so many different things in this space where you actually, so you have your design under your arm, you enter this space now where you meet these, the audience, you meet the real people, you meet the children, and now you go do it. But in that, even if it's just 45 minutes, you are going to be playing so many different roles in that to make that happen. So good facilitation of learning through play evolves and shifts over these 45 minutes, maybe you start with a reflection from last time. Maybe you, they work with portfolios. Maybe there is a presentation and suddenly you're like a coach or a facilitator. Then maybe there is a piece of instruction they need for them to get going and you step into, now I am going to tell you something. Now listen carefully. I'm going to say this only once. And you do that like that. And then they move into working in pairs and suddenly your role is shifting again and, 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 and. Again, back to that mindset of you being extremely flexible and using your whole toolbox of pedagogies eclectically of what is needed. I would say on the role repertoire, we definitely see that sometimes you are actually an observer. You're someone that just takes a step back and is documenting. You Maybe you're picking up data. Maybe you are reflecting on some few things before you enter back into the game. So you take these meta loops if you have the time, we are often very busy, right? But if it, it is a very good thing, those moments where we have, where we notice that they do not need us, those are magic moments. And they are actually a moments where we have succeeded quite a while, quite a, a while in terms of mindset and design, because that allows us actually to step into some of these other roles that are super, super valuable, both for us and for our children. 
Sometimes you are a play manager. Sometimes you're someone that is like engaging the play and then setting it up. And these are the rules and this is how we're going about it. Now you're playing. Sometimes you're co-playing. Sometimes you're going down on their level. You're just sitting down, being part of what's happening. Maybe we're doing this together and, and we, yeah. Sometimes you are play guide. Sometimes you are the instructor. As I say, thinking about the continuum that I had, it is really, really valuable for us as learning through play facilitators to reflect upon which of these is my preference. Are there any of these that I usually have a tendency of doing more than the others? And I would then urge you to try to play along and exercising to take some of the other positions. There are none of these that are right or wrong. And we all grew up probably in very much in the instructor way of things. Um, and maybe someone has a tendency of going in the other direction because that was what I experienced. And I do not want them to experience that because that was bad. But maybe we sometimes need to do that shift. That's what we see that the best practitioners do. And we definitely see them being very, very humble. And we see them seeing themselves as learner and carving out time to that top part of being an observer from time to time. And if they can't do it, then they definitely have a camera somewhere in the room picking up what's actually happening as a third eye because they are not able to be in the moment and actually reflect upon the moment at the same time. And if they can't be in a, in, a, in a learning group with colleagues and have people coming in from time to time observing, then that's definitely one thing that we see them do. And it is, so you could say, yeah, I see myself as a learner. Yeah, that's, that's also how I look at myself. And then it could, so, so what are you doing in terms of learn? How are you picking up data on your own of how you're going about things? How are you getting reflection? How are you getting these things done? And then some of us have to kind of say, oh yeah, but I don't really have the time. So, so, so I know these things, but I don't really get to do them. And that's, I would say, that's a big shift. And that's something that we need in the, I would say in the systems we work with and when we fight for better prep time, when we fight for more hands in the classroom, when we fight for all these things, which are true arguments, which are right arguments and uh, nothing wrong in them. But, but I would say we need some of those things to happen for us to do more of this, but we also need to do it. Even if we don't have that time, then we need to figure out ways to do it. The last and the third, the third part of the, of our triangle, is the the reflection the documentation the evaluation which uh, is i i mentioned this almost already right it is the tricky one it's the one that we don't really have time to it goes both for how we set up in our design how we set that up for our children do we just do the tests as i said in the classical mindset or are we the super progressive type where we have they have their own portfolio they make their own learning goals they they document and 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 is putting down things of of how their own progression is doing we have a school in billund that we have there the the parents uh, the parents conferences are run totally by the students so the students have designed that whole hour. They are showing stuff that they have been doing. They are explaining to their parents what they have learned and what they want to learn in the next period. So they are totally in the center. Maybe there are, I would say, smaller steps towards that journey. It maybe it is like, but the reflection part is, I would say it happens, of course, both something in our design and in our practice. And it's something that we carve out times to afterwards. And the purpose is to align the goals between the design and methods or products used to document progress. Be aware of what are the, what does good look like signs that you have been putting down from the start? What are we looking for here? What does success look like? Like, is that that we had a good lesson? No one walked out. No one started to cry today. If, we, if you're working with a really troublesome group of children, sometimes that's really like, Yes, yes, yes. They all stayed in class. I didn't have to send anyone out. Or my, 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 my wife has been working with the children with autism for over 20 years, right? And sometimes success is that no one had a, had a chair thrown at each other today. And that was, it was a really good day today. And so, so be really, really realistic, of course, is some of these things that we put in, how are they helping on some things? But there could actually also be things that are making children uneasy anxious or like they really don't like it they actually prefer what we did before and so things that might need to be introduced slowly and reflection is of course a place where we could begin to figure out did we succeed did we not succeed we have we have i think i mentioned that earlier 
we have a skyline on student behavior on these five play characteristics in the Lego Foundation. It sits within all our materials, and I'm sure it, it is shared in, in some of the other materials that we have. But it is places where, where, where indicators where, where, that we use towards what does meaningfulness look like, what does joyfulness look like. It is not made, I would say, for, for children with special need necessarily. So there could be things there where you say, yeah. That's not really what that looks like in my classroom, but then you could set down other markers or other things, uh, hopefully together with colleagues of stuff that we would say, this was what we would be looking for. We, I would always go for engagement. Engagement is key. So if they like it, if they want more of it, if, they, if the attention span is longer than usual. So if they stay on task for a longer time, that would be boxes that I would always say, yes, 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 yes. I'm running out of time here, uh, rapidly actually, uh, a few minutes ago. Um, yeah, but I, I think that's also on the speedy version what I would like to say upon reflection. Turning back to the, turning back to the model, um, mindset, design, practice and reflection is something that is connected and, and they are something that we need to carefully think about. Learning through play is carefully planned and, and I would say the activity with the Braille bricks uh, is definitely something, especially if it's new and it's something that, that your children hasn't done before, you haven't done before, spend as much time you can in all four quadrants <laughs> of trying to think about these things. There are tips, there's so much in Mark and Marie's materials on the webpage that are pointing towards these things. There are different did you know sections where there are things that are referring back to this. There are skills on the activity sheets that are tapping into a little bit of what are the different activities doing in, in terms of this? Um, so before we end, we would love to see your creations. And I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen because then I can see more of you guys, which I really, really want to. Uh, so if you, I don't know if you have the quadrant view, which I have right now, you yes. can see different things. So right now is the time that we hold up what we did. Actually going to take a little picture of you here. So I see a house, I see a cat, I see a man, I see a star, I see a tractor potentially or a car. Belvinda, uh, I'm not sure if I'm doing it wrong. Is that a tractor? Can you not? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. A I train. See, yeah, from Ania. Oh, cool. I Karina, have an ugly do? octopus. Well, that's an armband, a wristband, Karina, is that it? The heart. Ah, I can't see it sits there. And what, Victoria, can you get it closer to the camera, please? What is it, Victoria? <laughs> I, when you have to ask your children that, right? <laughs> what did you do, Victoria? Oh, we can't hear you, sorry. Uh, I think you're still, yeah. Train. A train. Rain, of course. I knew that. Sorry. I'll just ask you what the other thing. <laughs> Obviously. I, I could see that right away. <laughs> you know that. Guys, we are out of time. Sorry. I'll say if you if you like this idea of using local materials as well for stuff to do, I'll say stay tuned um, for 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 materials on the on the Lego Foundation webpage, which comes, I'll say within Q1, we are going to launch it, a whole platform of stuff that you could do at home. Uh, or anywhere with these uh, local materials. We hope that this was, as, as we said, when someone asked the good question to me, what is the learning, what, what do you hope people take away with this? I hope that you have gotten just a little bit curious upon your own practice. I hope that you have, that there is stuff in this that you kind of say, hmm, I'm going to think a little more on this, or I'm going to talk to my colleagues about this, or we're going to try to use some of that, then that would be awesome. Uh, and don't you worry, you're not going to, in the Braille community, you're not going to, we're not going to stay away. We're going to keep almost preaching, I would say, <laughs> these messages that we truly believe so, so strongly in. And I would say that even if we have launched the Braille break, this is still quite new territory to us. And, and Mark and Maria's obviously worked with this for decades, but that whole merging of learning through play 
and and this Braille brick and these things. There, there's so much innovation that lies out there in front of us that we that we do not know about. And we're gonna need all you guys that are there out there with the kids every day. Uh, we need you guys to kind of carry on being curious and carry on sharing into these communities so we can all learn and, and make that stronger. Um, so yeah. I think that's uh, yeah. That's all from, from from me. Thank you, Pierre. I see a lot of comments, great comments, and a lot of people were really happy and agreed with you during your talk. Is there a Facebook page for just the Brave Bricks? Yes, we have a Facebook uh, community called Lego Brave Bricks Community. You can apply. Um, you just have to register and answer to some questions. Thank you. Great advice. Great information. Where we can start using this framework from our exa uh, existing activities or creating new things. Any advice? That would be, I would say that would be the, uh, probably the five play characteristics. I would say there are good questions there where you could ask yourself if, if let's say that you and I had come up with a game where the, the children should be doing X, Y, C in the classroom, then just asking ourselves simple question in terms of how would this be meaningful to them or, or how would this be actively engaging to them or how would this be? And if we could tick some boxes in that, we should just go try and then let it hit the, uh, the, the heart jury, <laughs> the kids, and then we could see if if what we thought in our design was true, and sometimes it's not, and we have to uh, we have to paddle back. And uh, but other times it is like, I would say in terms of, of designing activities, engaging the children and the students in that is like one of the best thing we can do. And also asking them if they have tweaks or or, or uh, yeah things we could do differently in this. We just did this activity today. And then as a reflection activity or something, it's always cool to kind of say, hey, if we should do this again tomorrow, were there things we should be changing or were there things that could make this more fun or engaging? Uh, so just have that ping pong with them, um, which I bet you do. But it, it is, it is uh, that, that's... Uh, yeah, you have a lot of thank you from the chat, Pierre. Thank you, super. It was really cool. Very good message. Max says that she will share with colleagues. Thank you for your passionate presentation. So engaging. Yeah. <laughs> and maybe I can just remind you that we will have some more session next week about uh, the Braille bricks this time. Uh, someone asked, uh, do we need material? No, you just need to have some bricks. If you have the Braille bricks, that's great for next week uh, and nothing else. Thank you, great fun. Thank you from Mexico. Very much, thank you. A lot of thank Hello. you, Pierre. No, I'm cool. So, thank you, and maybe I can wish you a happy evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Maybe good morning for New Zealand. Yeah, and see you next week. We need coffee at five a.m. A lot of coffee. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. <laughs> thank you for the information and the good moments. Thanks. Okay. Take care, thank everyone. Thank you. Bye. And see I'm you going soon. To pop out now. Bye bye. Bye.